Hello, BookTube, <laughs> and welcome to your <laughs> to your daily penguin, which is our walkthrough of my Penguin Classic Wall, book by book and author by author, and up till now, era by era. This is the first bookcase I roughly organized a while ago, and then I lost interest in organizing. <laughs> I just sort of chucked things willy nilly, and I say that with a smile on my face. But of course, I would like more organization in my penguin wall, especially in terms of, of uh, groupings, because I'm at that wall all the time. I go to that wall all the time. Something in what I'm reading virtually every day throws me back, sends me back, sends me willfully going back uh, to the books that form my reading vocabulary, that form my oldest friends. So I will be reading something about uh, Wordsworth the Revolutionary or about uh, the Sultan Selim the First, or whatever, and something in it will will make me say, "Ah, what was that line in Keats?" Or, "Ah, what is that scene in the House of the Seven Gables?" Or, "What is that bit of business that that this reminds me of?" I always tell myself uh, that I'm that it's worth the long, rambling, uh, aimless search on that wall because it might be useful because I might incorporate that bit of business into a review of the, the newer book that I'm talking about, that almost never happens. <laughs> I, I only tell myself that because I need some flimsy excuse to spend time with my oldest bookish friends. Uh, and th that organization would help, of course, if all of my English literature to was together, for instance, my, my post-Shakespeare English literature, if all that was together, that would, be, that would help for me to find things. Half the time I can't find what I'm looking for over there. Uh, but that's a fringe benefit that this Penguin Classic tour will have for me. It's already started to have it. Is that I am going to start to pull things off the shelves and put them on the floor in order to look at the organizing that I'm going to do once I've done all this, once we've talked about all these books. It's a chance for me to go through every one of these one by one, deciding where they go and also deciding whether or not I need to keep them. Uh, now, whether or not I need to keep them is governed by a couple of things. I, oh, a, a few more things than are governed in the rest of my collection. I have worked hard with the rest of my book collection to impose a stringent set of rules on what I keep and don't keep. On what determines whether or not I'm going to keep a book. Because otherwise I'd be up to my eyeballs in them. Now maybe during a time of quarantine I would want to be up to my eyeballs in books, but not ordinarily at all. Not ordinarily. Usually what I want is a small, a large enough, but a small enough library so that it is responsive to my needs and not enormous and wasteful. And that is ordinarily the only criterion that I use. For, but for Penguins, I admit I like the logo, I like the company, I like the brand, I like uh, their editorial ethos. So I tend to just, when I'm at a used bookstore, I tend to hoover up. Penguin Classics, whether I'm all that interested in the book or not, or as we've seen, whether or not the Penguin Classic version of the book is the version that I would like to have. So I end up having two versions of a book. One that I have because I really like its introduction or its critical apparatus or its the edition that's chosen or whatever, and the other because it's a Penguin Classic, which isn't, it flies in the face of the rules that I apply everywhere else. To have something because of that is well, I don't know. I'm I'm revisiting and I'm rethinking it as things go. And if I if I have some books on that penguin wall just because they're penguins, well then how much more likely is that to be true if it's a penguin classic deluxe edition? A while ago, Penguin Classic started making deluxe paperback editions of things with, that have a heavier duty matte cover. The there's a newly commissioned artwork on the cover, usually front and back, sometimes even the insides. There are French flaps and deckled edges and uh, usually a high-profile new introduction. They're gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Penguin Classic Deluxe Editions are absolutely gorgeous. And I admit, I'm re more reluctant to give up one of those than I would be a normal Penguin Classic, even if it's an author I don't like. And that brings us to today's author. <laughs> because today's book is the Penguin Classic Deluxe Edition. Uh, the Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man by James Joyce. Uh, with a new cover. This cover is by Roman Maradov. It's, you've got uh, cover artwork on the front, cover artwork on the back, cover artwork on the flaps. 
So you see, you can see what I'm talking about. This just happens by random chance to be the one we're starting with. But you can see what I'm talking about. These are a lovely, this is a lovely thing for Penguin to do. And they are lovely additions. Uh, it's just that this is an author that I hate. And I have tried. I have tried very hard to like this author. Uh, but I remember the very first time that I encountered this author. And I encountered him in this book. And I was reading it. And I was about halfway through and I was frustrated. I found myself very frustrated with these coming-of-age adventures of Stephen Dedalus, and I couldn't figure out why. Yeah, there are all sorts of rhetorical hijinks in the book, but contrary to what a lot of people might think, I don't have any objections to rhetorical hijinks in fiction or nonfiction. I don't have any objection to that at all, provided it serves some sort of purpose. Uh, like, for instance, I absolutely love both the fiction and the nonfiction. Or I, lo I love John Dos Passos. And you, I couldn't, if I objected to, to verbal hijinks, I wouldn't. Uh, I love, to go all the way to the other end of the spectrum, uh, Dennis Cooper. Uh, Reynolds Price. Uh, Richard Price. I like people who, who play with language just fine. So it wasn't that I was objecting to that. But I was about halfway through this book the first time that I read it. Uh, when I started to, I, I, I started to be very irritated and I started wondering why. I started asking myself, why is this book irritating you? I wasn't a book critic at the time. <coughs> I, <coughs> uh, so maybe I wasn't as used to asking that question. I ask that question all the time now. When I read, when I pick up a new book uh, in, in advance copy and I'm reading through it, uh, I, I've, I've mentioned on this channel many times that usually if I can, if I'm not pressed for time, I will read the advance copy of a book uh, non-critically. I don't mean that to sound as condescending as it comes out, but there's no other word. I will read it impressionistically. I will read it through without thinking about assessing it critically in a review. So in other words, without a pencil in hand, just, you know, what am I making of this as I go along? Because I think those impressions are valuable for a, a critic to then remember and use. And when I do that now, I am inevitably still thinking about the critical review down the line, even if I don't write one. I'm still inevitably thinking of that. So I'm having those reactions, but then I'm analyzing them. I'm having those reactions, I'm thinking, okay, well, you're smiling from ear to ear right now in this chapter. Why is that? Why is that? It's not just going to be the plot, because this is all made up, so who cares? <laughs> it's going to be something else. Something else is making you smile. What is it? Uh, but at the time that I first read this, I didn't do any of that. It wasn't instinct yet, it wasn't reflex, and I wasn't a book critic. And yet, about halfway through, I realized that I was irritated, that it was angering me more and more the more I read it. And I did stop and ask myself why, and I couldn't figure it out, and then I finished the book, and I still couldn't figure it out. And then I talked with other people who had read this book, and gradually I realized what was angering me about this book. And that was that the words on the page, the creative effort of the author, James Joyce, was uh, intending to create a response in me other than a response to what I was reading. In other words, this is, this is billed as fiction, and yet it was very much intending to have the kind of effect that a soapbox lecture has on a street corner. I'm going to get up on a soapbox, I'm going to harangue people in demagoguery to get them all worked up and to convince them to bring them over to my worldview. And despite what anybody might think, that's not what fiction does. That's not what fiction is supposed to do. And fiction is bad at it. And this is that. This is... I realized after the fact, when I look back on it, that the reason I was angered while I was reading this is because this is, was trying to have an effect on me different from the effects that fiction tries to have on people and that fiction has had on me many, many times. Uh, and... Once I thought that, once I started to suspect that, I went back to this book. I've gone back to this book so many times. And I went back to it when I got this Penguin Classic Deluxe Edition. It's so beautiful, I can't bear to give it up. Uh, I went back to this book many times to analyze that, to anatomize what this is and why it's doing what it's doing. I plumbed the depths of a lot of the lies that have accumulated about this book over time, that scholars and passionate readers have, have told about this book in particular, over time, but also Dubliners, and also Joyce's two enormous, uh, very intentionally unreadable so-called masterpieces. But mainly about this book, as you can tell right away from the title, the utterly, utterly pretentious title, uh, 
I, I also analyzed a lot of the lies about this book. Often when you read about this book, you will be told, or the, uh, the phrase will be offhandedly tossed, uh, that this is loosely based on James, on James Joyce's own life. And that is not true. That is a lie, a demonstrable lie. This is completely mimeographically based on James Joyce's own life. Only the names have been changed. And nothing else. No, not the slightest detail. And the people who are, again, as I say all the time, the people who are involved in autofiction can always swear to that. <laughs> can, they can always swear to that. What reason would they have to lie? They can always swear to that. They can always say, yeah, I know he changed the names, and I know he maybe changed the location, but that thing that happens where he sees a girl bathing at the beach and has an epiphany, yeah, I, I talked to him not, not an hour later. He told it to me in exact detail, and he wrote it exactly as he told it to me. <sighs> in other words, autofiction. And, uh... Autofiction in the present day annoys the crap out of me because it tries to flow below, fly below the radar of accountability to readers. You, you think, autofiction writers think they have the ultimate backstop because if a critic says, well, this is a poorly imagined encounter, the author can say, well, it shows what you know. It actually happened exactly that way, in exactly that place, with exactly that dialogue, with exactly that person, and I can, I can contact them through Facebook to verify that if you don't believe me. So there, you go. Uh, there's one in your eye for saying that I was that this is implausible. It's not only implausible; it's exactly what happened. <laughs> one of the foremost perpetrators of that in the modern day is Karl Ovenosgard and his noxious, just effluvia, of series of books. My struggle. One of the problems that autofiction always produces in its perpetrators is a logaria. They just can't stop writing. They just obviously, as I mentioned, if since this has everything in common with a soapbox demagogue and nothing in common with literature, what is the thing about soapbox demagoguery that you know for a fact? What is, if for instance you were a soapbox, dem a soapbox demagogue and let's say you fell into the habit of having regular Klan rallies in the Deep South, what, would th what thing would be notable about those Klan rallies? That they go on for a long time. <laughs> that would be one thing that everybody would note about them, that they're really, really long. <laughs> and the same thing is true with a soapbox demagogue, you know, on the corner of the park. They'll talk all day, and that is that is an, a very much uh, a byproduct of autofiction, is that you you don't you just go on and on and on because and and you can't be told to edit, shorten, or make things more concise because you're responsible. You know, well, it didn't happen that way. It happened like this. So, what do you mean? You see this in most of the worst practitioners of autofiction. Uh, David Foster Wallace was very much one of those. <laughs> uh, but uh, Karl Oven Osgard is by far the most prolific in the modern day. And who writes the introduction to this Penguin Classic Deluxe Edition of Portrait of an Artist of a Young Man? Karl Oven Osgard. Is it awful? Yes, it is. It shows no literary awareness whatsoever. And it doesn't give much indication that he even knows what this book is, much less has ever read it. I get that impression when I listen to interviews with him, that he is basically uh, a non-bookish person. Who is now? Uh, now I might I might point out, because of the the reverence that the twenty first century gives to auto fiction, he is now a towering literary figure, having produced nothing of literary merit whatsoever. And although it's going to make the fanboys and the dude bros scream, I would posit largely the same thing for James Joyce. I'd go back a hundred years to do it, but I would posit largely the same thing for James Joyce, that he he has commanded. Uh, the reverence and the attention of a lot of people, not, I know there are some professors, there will always be exceptions, but he's commanded the, the, the affection and the reverence of a lot of people who aren't actually reading his books. Now, I, by that I don't mean that they don't turn the pages, I don't mean that their eyes don't see the words, I don't mean that they don't absorb the names on the plots, and in the case of... <sighs> Well, you we all know Bloomsday. You all know the kind of fetishization that this author's writing can produce in lots of people. I'm not saying that they don't read the book. I'm saying that they don't experience it as a book. Instead, they encounter the same phenomenon that I encountered when I first read this. That growing sense that this is supposed to be having effects on you that have nothing to do with it being a book. And instead of getting angered by that growing impression, a lot of those people like that. Those people are almost all men, and the reason that they like that is because they don't really like the, uh, the, the, the effect of reading. Uh, the long, slow, intensely quiet, intensely private, and intensely thoughtful reaction that literature, fiction or nonfiction, is supposed to have on you when you're reading it. When you're reading it, it's supposed to be working on you like slow, patient hands in loamy soil. 
It is not supposed to be flashing across your eyes like a video game. Unless you're kind of a little afraid on the inside of giving over to that first kind of reading and you really prefer the flashing across your eyes as video games. That maybe you suspect deep down inside that although you identify as a reader and maybe even teach literature, maybe you suspect deep down inside that if you gave yourself over to literature in that other way, it would bore you. You would realize that that self-identification was wrong. In other words, you're, pro you're operating from a sunk cost fallacy. You don't want to admit that there's a chance that you are not a reader. <laughs> but that's a whole other subject for a whole other video. The Penguin Classic for today is a portrait of the artist as a young man. Was he an artist? No. Is it a portrait? No. It, is, is it uh, annoyingly condescending and pretentious to call yourself uh, the artist, uh, an artist as a young man? Yeah. It is. And is this book worth your reading? Well, again, we're going to have this split, and we're going to have it a number of different times now that we're in relatively open territory here, and we don't know what we're going to be encountering. Of course, in 2020, if you want to be, uh, if you want to be what is widely considered to be a well-read person, then you have to read this book. And it's not long. Unfortunately, there'll be plenty of people out there who will tell you that you also need to read Ulysses by this author, James Joyce's Ulysses. Not Steve Donahue's Ulysses, James Joyce's Ulysses. Uh, they are wrong. <laughs> they are very much wrong. A single small segment of James Joyce's Ulysses will be enough for you to know what it is. I trust that if you read that sting single small segment, you won't then talk about James Joyce's Ulysses as though you've read the whole thing, but I don't advise reading the whole thing. It's a slog, and it's intended to be. Large chunks of this book are intended to be a slog. If an author makes up words, gives them inconsistent meanings, then moves on, forgets them, and makes up more, that is a very different thing than, for instance, an Anthony Burgess in Clockwork Orange making up words and then lexico lex uh, keeping a lexography strictly in place so that you know a new vocabulary by the time you're done with the book. Um, <laughs> large parts of this book, in other words, are pure self-indulgence. Which is, if uh, those of you, <laughs> those of you who haven't dug beneath the uh, the Jesuit Catholic objections, will probably probably don't need any he any help to to know that my main objection to autofiction is its self indulgence. Self indulgence is always wrong, <laughs> and self indulgence on the printed page, published and then put out in the world for money for people to buy, is incredibly wrong. <laughs> and th this. Large, I mean, Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake are pure self-indulgence. Large parts of this are self-indulgence, but not all of it. There are bits and pieces here and there in this book that are effective. I don't think that's recommendation enough to read it, but nevertheless, that's going to be the dichotomy recommendation that we're going to get on these Daily Penguins a lot coming up, where I'm going to say, uh, I deeply dislike this book. I can tear it to pieces and defend every single criticism that I make. This is exactly the point. When I, when I launch onto an opinion about this particular author or David Foster Wallace or Carl Over or whatever, this is exactly the point when dude bro aficionados will say, well, you know, all reaction to literature is just personal opinion. It's all subjective. So, you know, you're saying this guy stinks and I have been raised since I was 13 to think that he is absolutely great, just unquestioningly great, just perfectly great, just perfect. And yeah, it sounds like you read a lot and it sounds like you might know what you're talking about, but that's what I'm going to shift to. All reaction is, is subjective. All, all assessment of literature is subjective. That isn't true at all. All reaction to literature is subjective. All assessment of literature is not. It is entirely possible to read a novel and say that book was objectively bad. That nobody likes to hear that. In, uh, in the 21st century, where we all, you know, Pache, Daniel Patrick Monaghan, where we all very much are accustomed to having our own facts. And where saying a, an old white guy say, oh, oh I'm, I believe I'm even cis. <laughs> an old cis white guy saying this particular book is objectively bad would get dragged, would get ratioed on social media for, for a condescension. And, oh, yeah, this is your white privilege talking. How are you, who are you to say that any book is good or bad? Okay. All right, fine. I'm hoping that we're dealing on a different level of discourse here. But one way or another, uh, this is a bad book. <laughs> and this author never wrote a good one. So on one hand, I'm saying, this is, this is a bad book. It will try your patience pointlessly. 
It won't make you a better reader by trying your patience. It will just try your patience pointlessly. But, on the other hand, it has firmly lodged, like a corn cob seed, way in the back teeth, it has firmly lodged itself in the modern canon of Western literature. So on that level, it is a recommendation. On that level, if you care about such things, then then you have to do this. Then you have to read this. You don't have to read the two gigantic baggy monsters. But this and Dubliners, uh, maybe you do. It won't take you very long to do. It'll take you a lot longer than it would have taken if Joyce hadn't been such a coward. He wrote it this way because he was afraid of competing. And that's another reason why people love autofiction, because it, it gives them the illusion that they are leaving the arena, that they aren't competing, that they are quite literally marching to the beat of their own drummer. And so, again, they can't be criticized. As a critic, of course, that enrages me. But that's going to be your Penguin Classic for today. It's, I, it's, uh, it's, I'm going to have to come up with another word. It's not a recommendation. I don't recommend that you read this, even for canonical reasons. But in order to be stereotypically well-read, you have to know this book. You have to read it. Uh, you're not going to like it. And if you do, you're going to like it only because you're moving the goalposts of what you like and don't like. Uh, in a way that you won't do unless you have forewarned to do it. <laughs> unless you are forewarned to do it. The only people who say they like this book in 2020, the only men who come to this book and say, read it and say they like it, are the ones who came to it already knowing that they were the kind of person they think should like this book. <laughs> if, you, if you stripped all the stuff off it, all the identifiers changed, all the names, take Joyce's name off it, take that cultural baggage away from it, Strip it of its dude bro status, put it between brown paper covers, and hand it to those same men, they would hate it. They would say it was a completely indulgent waste of time. And oh my god, if you if you put it between brown, brown paper paper wrappers and gave it a woman as, a, as the author, oh, they'd tear it to shreds. They'd tear it to shreds. And the thing about a lot of these readers, th those male readers that I'm talking about, is that they don't even know this. They aren't even aware of it because their teachers aren't allowed to say these kinds of things to them. Or have long since, you know, swallowed the pill themselves. But one way or another, you know what I mean. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, I actually am gonna beat this dead horse quite often in future Penguin videos, but I don't need to do it anymore in this video. So we have, a, we have, we have to hold two competing thoughts in our mind at the same time, which I'm sure we can do. On the one hand, you know what I'm saying when I say this is a part of the canon. If it matters to you to be conversant with the canon, to know what you're talking about, to experience everything in the canon of all the different symphony of voices, then you have to read this. If you only care about, yes, it's part of the canyon, but I want to know, is it good? Well, no, it's not good. There's barely anything in it that's good. It is less worth your time to read than even a minor novel by a genuinely good author. It, it just, it's a perfect example of what I'm talking about, that all of the Dubros line up around the corner to read and memorize and then name drop at parties, crap like this, have never read Dos Passos. Never read Stephen Crane. <laughs> anyway, anyway. Uh, so that's, that's the split screen of your Penguin recommendation. We'll see if we can get away from that for tomorrow. But uh, as to the practical effect of doing this, this penguin tour i don't know i shouldn't keep this I, I shouldn't keep it i'm never going to teach it again i'm never going to read it again it's it's a beautiful thing though it's a beautiful penguin classic deluxe edition so i don't know why i have to figure this out as i go along i don't know what i'm going to do you know exhaustively i don't know what i'm going to do maybe i will read this again someday Maybe I will revisit Joyce. Although, un when, unlike what I say about other authors, there are plenty of authors that I don't like that I can imagine revisiting down the line and maybe changing my opinion about. That's happened a few times in my life, and it's always been a very pleasant experience. Unsettling, but pleasant. But I have revisited this author so many times. I don't imagine I've left any avenues open to find a way to think that he's genius. Or to think even that he's good. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know what I'll do with this vlog. I'll put it back on the shelf for now. Oh, no, I'll put it, I'm making piles on the floor. I'll put it on the floor. I'm taking advantage of the fact that my dog is not incontinent and isn't even interested in, in chewing things or attacking things or anything like that unless I'm holding it. So I can put stuff on the floor for now to reorganize these penguins. So we're, we're in the wild now. We are not, we could go anywhere. Tomorrow could be anything. So I'm gonna, we're doing this for now, and we'll see what we do tomorrow. <laughs> Sorry this one, that our first free and clear Penguin Classic was such a, 
a Debbie Downer, but maybe tomorrow will be different. <laughs> I will see you then. Thank you, Booktube.